Okay, welcome everyone. This is the 2021 New York State World Language Professional Learning Series. My name is Candace Black and I'm your World Language Associate in the Office of Bilingual Education and World Language. And it is my pleasure you to welcome you to Understanding Unit Planning with the Revised New York State World Language Standards. This is part one of a four part series and it, it includes the following description. With a robust interdisciplinary unit theme established, teachers are ready to explore key steps in planning a standards-based, culturally contextualized thematic unit plan. The presenters will suggest ways to carry out the recursive process of planning and sequencing learning tasks that integrate the modes of communication. They'll explain how to identify a toolbox of key vocabulary and grammatical structures that support language functions and proficiency targets from initial brainstorming to implementation. For teachers who have established unit plans, the presenters will share strategies for auditing and potentially revising those unit plans to align with the revised New York State Learning Standards for World Languages and Checkpoint Proficiency Targets. We're going to review just a few housekeeping details. Uh, we are still admitting people from the waiting room. We have about 500 people registered for today, so we appreciate your patience. If you accidentally get disconnected from this webinar, don't worry, we're here for you. Go ahead and just reconnect. You can always give me a call at 585-356-0951. I'm going to be entering the link to the handouts folder in the chat following this introduction. In this folder, you'll find all kinds of goodies, including the standards, the themes, proficiency targets, and of course, the materials that have been designed for this particular workshop. You'll have on-demand access to this, and it will also be posted on the website following this workshop. Within about 24 hours of this event, those who attend the workshop in full will receive either a certificate of attendance or a certificate documenting CTLE credit. The type of certificate you'll be receiving was indicated in the confirmation email that you received after you registered. As Bill noted, this workshop is being recorded. The video will be uploaded to the World Languages Professional Learning website within about a week of this event. Those who are unable to attend this live webinar will be able to earn CTLE credit by viewing the video and answering seven out of 10 questions on a post-assessment correctly. Before I introduce our presenters, I'd like to thank the following individuals for their help in assisting with this workshop. Louisa Mota, Eris Thompson, Barbara Patterson, and Kimberly Harder. Our workshop presenters today are Bill Heller, Dr. Lori Langer de Ramirez, and Dr. Joanne O'Toole. Without further ado, it's my pleasure to invite Bill, Lori, and Joanne to begin this workshop. So thank you everyone for being here today. And as we always do, we start by telling you to mark your calendar. So we have three additional workshops coming up around unit planning, starting with Rebecca Blue Wolf's workshop on Checkpoint A, and that it's not just specifically Checkpoint A, but it also refers to units that maximize target language use and build global awareness, Tuesday, November 9th from 4 to 5 p.m. Unit Planning 2 at Checkpoint B with Lisa Shepard. Plan learning experiences for your students in the interpretive, interpersonal, and presentational modes. That will be Tuesday, November 30th, 4 to 5 p.m. And finally, with Regina O'Neill, Unit Planning, again, Part 2, Checkpoint C, highlight and celebrate the people and cultures of the African diaspora on Tuesday, December 7th, from 4 to 5 p.m. The registration is open now. CTLE credit is available. And again, all sessions are recorded, so you can go back and watch them after the fact or you can watch them on demand. So again, today our topic is understanding unit planning with the revised New York State World Language Learning Standards. As typical, we have our webinar symbol key, so the microphone on mute. There's going to be a lot of folder content. You'll see that folder icon. Think alone. We do have about 500 people on this webinar, so we won't be able to chat throughout just at the end. And you'll see that chat box at the very end. And we do ask you to refrain from chatting throughout the session so that people can stay focused on the presentation. 
We have four goals for today. I can identify elements of the framework that informs standards-based world language unit planning. I can identify contents of the New York State World Language Unit Plan template and resources to support development of a standards-based unit plan. I can analyze unit plans at three proficiency checkpoints for how they apply the framework and prepare learners to carry out the revised New York State World Language Learning Standards. And finally, I can identify a set of strategies for auditing my current unit plans to align to the revised New York State World Language Learning Standards. Unit plans. You know them, you've been using them, and you know that they are the building blocks of the curriculum, the curriculum at the course level, the curriculum at the checkpoint level, the curriculum of an entire program. And we are looking at designing thematic units of instruction that are supported by the integration of multiple topics. So what informs standards-based world language unit planning? In 2016, ACTFL, our national world language professional organization, introduced what they referred to as core practices for world language learning. You may be familiar with this visual and the term core practices. They refer to them as research-based strategies for effectively developing your students' language proficiency. One of the core practices that they identified was planning with backward design. And you may already be familiar with that from Wiggins and McTie. For each one of their core practices, they describe it by answering three questions. What, why, and how? So in regard to planning with backward design, Actful said, and again, building on the work of Wiggins and McTie, the what is that it identifies the desired results, determines acceptable evidence, and plans learning experiences and instruction. And why would we use it? Well, it's a deliberate planning that focus on languages, language proficiency development, deep culture learning, and connections to other disciplines. And how is it done? We set proficiency targets, we write can-do statements, we plan assessment and plan instructional tasks with standards and proficiency in mind. However, in 2021, Glisson and Donato published volume two of the book, Enacting the Work of Language Instruction, High Leverage Teaching Practices. High leverage teaching practices, you may already be familiar with that term, are a little bit different than core practices. And they're defined as the fundamental instructional practices that are complex, that are often not visible through observation, definition, or brief explanation, that are deemed essential and are situated in theory and research. And Blisson and Donato, with two new high leverage teaching practices that were published in volume two of this text, build on the core practice of planning with backward design, starting with high leverage teaching practice number seven, which they entitled Establishing a Meaningful and Purposeful Context for Language Learning. What it introduces to the backward design model is the notion of an inquiry question and the importance of first establishing a context. They then added high leverage teaching practice number eight, which they entitled, whoop, we need to go back one, there we go, planning for instruction using an iterative process of backward design. And you'll see step two, three, and four were already in that core practice 
and high leverage teaching practice number eight adds self assessment and reflection. So what you have in front of you is the framework that we will be building on in presenting um, ideas around unit planning for the revised New York State World Language Learning Standards. So let's get started by looking at the inquiry question. Now, I want to point out that the inquiry question is not exactly the essential question that you may already be familiar with from backward design. The inquiry question provides a rationale and a motivation for exploring a unit theme. It's framed as an overarching question to consider or a compelling or relevant problem to solve. It's answered by students' synthesis of information and communicative exchanges performed throughout the unit. You should be hearing shades of interpretive, presentational, interpersonal communication here. And it takes into consideration students' proficiency level. So while we're thinking about proficiency level, let's just take a moment to recall what the proficiency checkpoint ranges are for our checkpoints A, B, and C. Categories one and two are shown at the left. Category three and four languages shown at the right. I just want to point out that everything we're talking about today is specific to modern languages. We are working on developing a set of webinars for our classical language teachers. But these proficiency checkpoint ranges, if you want to either refresh your memory or learn more about them, you can refer to the webinar that we presented this summer on understanding checkpoint proficiency targets. And again, the proficiency ranges are mapped onto the proficiency ranges in the actual proficiency scale, as illustrated in the inverted pyramid and the actual proficiency guidelines. So now that we have an inquiry question, we need to carry out step one, establishing the context. So we need to start with the right mindset. And that mindset is the mindset for thematically based unit planning. Are our units culturally focused? Communicative, I can't even talk, communicatively purposeful, intrinsically interesting or relevant to our students, cognitively engaging, and of course, standards based. And you may recall this from our webinar on the New York State World Language themes and topics. So we establish the context with a mindset, but we also establish it, Bill, using our New York State World Language themes and topics as illustrated in this handout that's in your folder and also on the State Ed website. We can see that we have four overarching themes. We have 17 topics that are assigned to those themes. And these topics are spiraled across the three proficiency checkpoints. So this is our starting place for establishing our context. So all of these points that I just made come together in our unit plan that we are presenting to you, introducing to you tonight in this portion, introductory portion called the unit plan context. You can see that you can fill it in by naming your language and course, the length of the unit. We have drop down menus, so you can just click on choose an item and choose the proficiency checkpoint A, B, or C, and the proficiency target that's associated with it. A meaningful unit title that you create, and the drop-down menu for your anchor theme, 
your anchor topic, and those integrated world language topics. You can write up a brief overview of what this unit is going to be about and your inquiry questions. So let me point out now that later in this presentation, you'll actually see what this looks like filled out for a unit at checkpoint A, a unit at checkpoint B, and a unit at checkpoint C. Step two tells you to identify the desired outcomes. Well, what better way to identify um, the desired outcomes than to use the unit level can do statements? You may recall, it starts with the words I can, followed by a language function, and then the context that you've already established. Unit level can do statements lead with a standard informed language function. And by standard inform, I'm reminding you that each one of our standards has one or more language functions associated with it. It provides the communicative context that you've already established. It's written in learner friendly language. It's not task specific because remember this is at the unit level. So there'll be multiple ways for students to demonstrate it across a unit and it will accommodate a range of proficiencies. And you can refresh your memory or learn more by referring to the Understanding Performance Indicators and Can Do webinar that we presented back in August. So let's take a quick look at what those language functions are in our communication standards. We can see in interpretive communication, Bill, I need you to click, that our three language functions are understand, interpret, analyze. In interpersonal communication, exchange information, express feelings, preferences, and opinions. And in presentational communication, describe, inform, narrate, explain, persuade. We also have language functions in our culture standards. Standard four, we see the three functions of identify, describe, and explain. And the cultural comparison standard has the one language function of compare. So step three is determining that acceptable evidence. So we need to identify a set of performance tasks, tasks that are to be carried out in a given communicative mode, using the language skills associated with the mode in a text type appropriate to the proficiency level. And most importantly, that demonstrate the can do statement that you've already identified for each one of the modes of communication. And again, you can learn more about this or refresh your memory from the webinar on understanding performance indicators and can do statements. A tool to really help you with this process are our New York State World Language Performance Indicators. They can help you guide your decisions around acceptable evidence. So for example, if I were, um, I had my presentational can-do statement and I were determining what my performance tasks would be, I would look and I'm teaching at the intermediate low level. I can look at what the performance indicator has to say and identify appropriate skills. And I'm going to have you click, Bill. So presentational communication can be spoken, written, or signed. And my text type, simple sentences. So I want to make sure that my performance tasks have my students carry out the language functions from the can-do statement in the context identified by the can-do statement and having my students um, use either do it speaking or writing or signing in simple sentences. And looking at the template again, we'll see that there are places for us to document those desired outcomes. You can see all five standards listed 
and their functions noted in blue right underneath. So you can be thinking about those as you write your unit level can do statements and you identify your acceptable evidence. And your summative performance tasks will flow right from those unit level can do statements and the acceptable evidence you've identified. So step four in our framework is to plan the learning experiences. So I just want to say that this is a topic much too big to address in this webinar. So instead, we invite you to go back to the webinars that we presented on each of the five standards, interpretive communication, interpersonal communication, presentational communication, and of course, the two culture standards. Again, these are all archived. And each one of these presents approaches to designing um, tasks specific to the standards, as well as many, many examples. Our unit plan template has a portion called that we refer to as the toolbox and the tools. And you'll find a place to indicate what those key language functions are that were in your can do statements, and then to consider the language structures and supporting vocabulary so that students can effectively carry out the language functions. I will say that we don't have the webinars already done on these, but rather you want to be looking ahead to what's coming in early 2022. And then, of course, a place to document your resources and materials. The authentic resources we discussed multiple times in the webinars we've already presented. And of course, there's a range of materials you might use to support um, carrying out all of the language tasks that you've identified. So that final step in the framework, self-assess and reflect. What better way than to use the can-do statements? So having your students go back to the can-do statements and indicating, are these can-do statements ones that I can do with confidence? Or I'm almost there? Or I can do them with help? Or I'm not quite there yet? And again, we invite you, if you haven't seen it, to watch the webinar on understanding performance indicators and can-do statements, where you will learn much more about can-do statements for self-assessment, reflection, and many other purposes. So at this point, I invite you to think, and again, we don't have the opportunity to chat right now. We'll chat at the end of the session. What new understandings do you have about unit planning with the revised New York State World Language Learning Standards? Thinking about this framework, thinking about the unit plan template. So take just a moment to reflect on that. And then we will turn this over to my colleague, Lori Langare Ramirez, who will show you what it looks like at checkpoint A. Oh, I'm being silenced for my over exuberance around this animal, the capybara. 
Thank you so much for your patience. Good afternoon, everyone. It's so great to see so many um, smiling faces. Thank you for being here. Uh, I'm going to share with you a little um, a snapshot of what this all looks like um, with a unit that I have created for my sixth graders. So we start, as Joanne um, explained, with step one, establishing the context. And those of you who've been to some of our sessions um, will recognize um, this particular context and this particular animal. And so um, we're going to start with an inquiry question. And that inquiry question for my sixth graders has to do with their friendship groups. So do you have friends that are not part of your group, part of your friendship group? And any of you who teach middle school know that this is quite a heady question, and one that um, really inspires lots of conversations. So go ahead and click, Bill. And the answer for the capybara is most definitely has friends that form that are not part of his friend group or his own uh, group of animals even. So that is one of the inquiry questions that we're going to start, um, start working on with this unit. Go ahead, Bill, thank you. And so we start with this premise, um, having seen so many photos of the capybara and all his friends. Go ahead, Bill. We know that the capybara loves cats, um, loves dogs, enjoys birds, quite a gregarious fellow, monkeys even, and of course you can't forget turtles. And so what we have here is for my unit um, a, a meaningful title. Go ahead Bill and we'll click. And so this is kind of your overview, right? So establishing the context, um, we start as I said um, this is a grade, uh, sixth grade. This is Spanish one for these students. The length of the unit is around two to three weeks. And this is checkpoint A, novice high. As I said, the meaningful unit title, I'm calling it in Spanish, La Capibara Contenta. In English, it's the Happy Capybara. So either way, you've got either alliteration or rhyming. So we're good to go. Um, but I think this is meaningful and interesting for students. For the anchor theme, it is a clear connection to identity and social relationships. Um, and the anchor topic is family and social relationships. And we're also integrating lots of other topics throughout the unit. So there's a connection to identity, leisure. There's a whole section on food and meal taking with the capybara. We're going to be exploring the capybara's physical environment, um, the biome and region in which he lives. And there's even a connection to shopping later on with clothing. So there's lots of good connections here for integrating the world language topics. So this section here, the brief unit overview, this is an area where you get to give the, the background. And everyone is going to do this ever so slightly differently. Um, I wanted to narrate the background of this animal, why this animal is compelling and serves as a really wonderful foundation for a thematic unit. Um, and so I'm giving a little bit of a narrative over uh, about the animal and what we're going to explore in this unit. And then finally, as I said, we have the inquiry question. Um, we have several though. So not just do you have friends that aren't part of your friend group, but we're also going to be exploring what makes a good friend. And again, for my sixth graders, perhaps for yours as well, that's a topic that is really compelling and part of everything they're thinking about all the time. All right, so let's, let's dive in a little bit and have a look at what some, um, some tasks might look like. These are unit level tasks. Um, and we're looking at really unit level can do statements and acceptable evidence. This is step two in that graphic that Joanne shared with you earlier. So identifying desired outcomes and determining acceptable evidence. One of the can do statements that students will be addressing is I can identify the topic important facts and activities relating to capybaras and their friends by answering questions about illustrated articles and videos. So they'll be seeing videos, they'll have graphic organizers that allow them to respond to certain prompts, and they're taking on um, the identity of a scientist. They're observing through this lens and they're going to be responding and taking, some, taking down some information. They're also going to be viewing this plethora of images that exist of the capybara with all sorts of different animal friends. 
they're going to be looking at the images, but also reading the text um, and the images and the text combined to convey all sorts of information about the capybara's friends and also the activities that the capybara does with these friends. And so this is an example of interpretive communication tasks. Go ahead, Bill. For interpersonal communication, students will exchange opinions about friendship in a conversation with a classmate to compare capybara friendships with their own friendships. And this can get really interesting, as you can imagine. They will exchange information about their friends in a conversation with a classmate to agree on some characteristics that make a good friend. And so this interpersonal communication is toggling back and forth between the friendships that capybaras have and students' own friendships. For presentational communication, unit level can-do statements um, include, I can describe the characteristics of a good friend, in a poster for the classroom about how to be a good friend. This is really useful. I could have used this in today's uh, sixth grade class that I just had. I can report information about capybaras in a short audiovisual presentation to younger students. And indeed, our students will be involved in creating these uh, audiovisual presentations for our elementary level students. And they're really excited to, um, to view those. They will exchange opinions about using animals for food and clothing, which is a cultural component of this unit, in a simple debate with a small group of classmates. And this one I would do with students in pods, um, and they can, they can talk about the capybara who is used as food in different parts of the Spanish-speaking world, and we're going to get to that in the cultural comparisons in a moment as well. For cultural products and products and practices, unit level can do statements involve, I can identify cultural products and practices related to the capybara by examining artifacts that use the image of capybaras. And so they'll be viewing images with some text to explain what it is that students are seeing and also the country of origin. And so we see images of the capybara on coins, on stamps, um, also on menus. Uh, and so students will be viewing those um, images and reading the text and then also talking about what they feel about, what they think that these images might mean. So looking at the practices and products to hopefully get to those perspectives behind uh, the use of the capybara, either as something that is venerated and, and raised up as on coins um, and stamps or possibly used for food and for clothing. And then finally, this one is one that I had the great good fortune of discussing with my colleagues, Bill and Joanne. Um, and this is something I encourage you all to do as well. This is a, um, a certainly a sensitive topic for students. Um, I can tell you in my own school, this comparison between pets and food is something that my sixth graders are very primed to discuss and very fascinated by. Um, and so the unit level can do statement here is I can compare cultural practices related to eating animals versus keeping them as pets in one's own culture and in Spanish speaking countries by completing Venn diagrams with a partner. What's great about a task like this is that it really can access each student's individual cultures and family backgrounds. Um, for some students, there might be, uh, they might discuss kosher food versus uh, certain animals that they can and cannot eat. Um, perhaps they're vegetarian or vegan. And so that comes to play and you're really tapping into each student's um, background. But this is an example of cultural comparisons. Um, and now let's have a look at what this looks like in the template. And so here we see in the first um, part of the grid, interpretive communication, you have your functions there, right there for you to use. Um, and so again, they're identifying a topic by answering questions about articles and videos, by answering questions about a series of images. Again, for interpersonal communication, they're exchanging opinions about friendship, and about their own friends in conversations with classmates, comparing capybara friendships and their own friendships and talking about the characteristics of what makes a good friend. For presentational communication, they're describing the characteristics of a good friend uh, in a poster for the classroom. They're reporting information 
about capybaras in a short audiovisual presentation for younger students. Or they're exchanging opinions about using animals for food and clothing in a simple debate, or maybe not so simple debate, with a small group of classmates. For cultural product, practices and products, students can identify these products and practices related to the capybara by examining artifacts that use the image of capybaras. And ultimately, cultural comparisons. Students compare cultural practices related to eating animals versus keeping them as pets in one's own culture and in Spanish speaking countries by completing a Venn diagram with a partner. So again, you can see in this part of the template, um, you're looking at the standard and function, which is listed, and then you fill in the unit level can do statements followed by acceptable evidence. And then we move to summative performance tasks. And this is one of several likely um, in a unit, um, in my unit about the capybara. In this summative task, students are looking at that image um, at the capybara with those titles and looking at all the different friends, reading the information about the activities that they do. And so that's the interpretive task. And interpersonal task, students will compare what the capybara does with what they like to do what they do with different friends. Perhaps they have certain activities that they do with some friends, which ones are different. So they'll have that conversation with a partner. And then for the presentational component, they will fill in a calendar or an agenda page with a list of things they like to do and the friends that also like to do that, those activities or the friends they do those activities with. So this is a summative performance task. And we can see how that fits into the template here. Again, the students will view a series of photos of the capybara with titles and list the activities that they also do. With a partner, compare the activities that the capybara enjoys with ones that they like to do with their friends, which ones do they have in common, which ones are different. Maybe some of the friends are in common and different. And then for the presentational task, they'll fill in this agenda page with a list of things they like to do and the friends they like to do them with. And then we have the language toolbox. So we'll be talking more about this in the future, um, but to give you a sense for what might go into these areas of the template, again, you're looking for your key language functions. So in this case, they'll be identifying leisure activities, describing friends, expressing preferences about activities and explaining the things that they like to do, our students like to do, and the friends they like to do them with. So for supporting language structures, what language do we need to be able to do that? These language structures need to support the language functions, right? So they'll need present tense verbs of action, the verb to be with some descriptive adjectives, They'll need expressions like I like to plus a verb or I prefer something because, and they might need some comparatives. They'll likely need some other things as well, but this is a good start for supporting language structures. And then for supporting vocabulary, they'll of course need the different names of animals, some leisure activities, especially the ones that they most like to do. Foods and snacks, as I said, that is later a part of this unit where they get to explore what the capybara eats and include that in the activities he likes to do. There is a section on clothing where the capybara is clothed and we get to incorporate that um, into the students' exploration of this animal. They also compare the clothing that they like to wear. Again, comparative uh, vocabulary and descriptive adjectives. So these are our language we call the language toolbox. And then resources. Um, as you can probably tell, I've, div uh, I've dived deep into the world of the capybara. Um, you all likely have experienced similar um, experiences where you um, get involved in a particular topic for your students and you dive deep and you start finding all sorts of great resources. I have a Pinterest board where I've, I'm saving all of these great images because you never know when you're going to need them. And that's called the Happy Capybara, and the link is there. 
Um, I also have this unit fleshed out in, um, in digital materials. This was designed um, initially for teaching during the remote times. Um, and so a lot of the materials that I have, which I normally would have in hard copy, um, are digitized and uh, included on that page. So you're welcome to visit and use what you need. And so these types of materials will fit into the template under resources and materials. So authentic resources, there are tons available at all different proficiency levels for the capybara, hopefully for your topics and themes as well. Um, so here you will list videos, articles, um, all sorts of materials, Pinterest image collections. Um, you can see I have included links there. I encourage you to include as much information as you can as soon as you get it so that you can always refer back to it. It's good to have there on the page. For other materials, I have a student work packet. Um, this is in our school, we call it a plan de trabajo or a, an assignment. Um, and so this has materials for students to have, I, again, either digitally or printed out. And so that would be under other materials. And then finally, I have this image that I will use with my students for a do now activity where they have to describe what is happening in this particular image. And they, they find that one pretty compelling. So that's an example of a checkpoint uh, of a novice level checkpoint a unit and how it might be fleshed out in the unit plan. Um, my colleagues are going to be sharing some examples for checkpoint B and C, and we will be talking a little bit more about all of this um, with your questions later on in the session. I'll pass it on to my colleague Bill. Just to give a general idea of what a uh, checkpoint B unit plan might look like. I'm just going to show you the the template and how we, we do it. Um, I developed a checkpoint B unit on, uh, it was a function oriented unit based on the function of giving and asking for device, advice called problemas, problemas, problema, problemas. Um, it's about the idea of problem solving and seeking advice. So um, its key, key topic is identity and social relationships. It's uh, or key theme rather, key topic is family and social relationships. And then integrated into it are topics of identity, school life, health and wellness and food meal taking. I give a brief overview where I just tell you how this is relevant to the student's life and what are some of the uh, areas we'll be exploring and identify an inquiry question, uh, how do we solve problems and where do we go to look for good advice? Those are our two inquiry questions. Identifying can-do statements. Now, since this is a um, function-focused unit, most of the um, can-do statements relate to the function of asking for and giving advice. In the interpretive, we're going to analyze uh, authentic resources in two different contexts, the context of the steps to solving a problem, kind of the meta, metacognitive idea of what uh, solving a problem is, and um, identifying um, the second context is talking about relationships and well-being, usually using authentic documents. And you'll see different um, tasks that they'll be asked, the students will be asked to do to show that they can identify the main idea in details. And again, this plan is in the resource folder in a PDF format that you can read. For the interpersonal, we're going to be asking for and giving advice and expressing agreement and disagreement. Um, one of the tasks they'll do for asking and giving advice are having conversations uh, about solving common problems. Agreement and disagreement would be analyzing different um, advice and seeing if it's good advice or bad advice. And then in presentational communication, again, asking for and giving advice is our target function. And they'll do various tasks to show this, composing letters in the written form, recording short videos in spoken form, and then role-playing solutions uh, to self-care. Again, this would be also a, an oral uh, project. And then uh, reporting information, we're going to go back and revisit the function of reporting information, and they'll report the results of the survey that they do. For the cultural um, can-do statements, uh, at Checkpoint B, our cultural function is describing cultural practices 
related uh, and pr products. So we're going to take the idea of superstitions, the culturally embedded idea of superstitions, examine superstitions in target language countries, um, giving opinions about superstitions, uh, and presenting role plays about making a decision based on a superstition. And then, of course, we can take those superstitions in standard five and make a Venn diagram and compare them um, with our own community superstitions. The, in, the different summative tasks, we can have them ask questions, answer questions about Instagram posts that give advice for success and happiness. An interpersonal task where they role play situations uh, spontaneously uh, about seeking advice. And then they um, uh, write a letter to next year's Spanish class, giving them advice for success in class. The language toolbox, the functions again, asking for and giving advice, agreeing and disagreeing. They need in Spanish, they need um, the verb deber, to ought to, or to should, or to must, plus an infinitive. We want them to have partial control of that, necessitar, plus an infinitive, to need to do something. And then we're also going to introduce the idea of familiar commands, and uh, we'll help the students get some conceptual control with a lot of scaffolding. And our support vocabulary will include question words, reactions to good and bad ideas, health habits, sources of uh, stress and self-care, uh, study habits, and problem-solving steps. And these will be introduced and reinforced through a variety of uh, authentic resources. And then finally, those resources are listed with links, and along with some teacher-made materials that, um, uh, that would be used to uh, enhance the unit. Now, Joanne will talk about uh, a checkpoint C unit. And I just want to point out that the unit that unit plan that Bill has shown you and the one that I'm showing you relate to the examples that we gave in the themes and topics webinar. So that might be useful to have as background information. So the unit plan I present here is for checkpoint C, Sabores de la América Latina, the flavors of Latin America. And again, you see the context, um, approximate four week unit for Spanish five with an anchor theme of contemporary life and an anchor topic of food and meal taking, but multiple integrated topics of celebrations, customs and traditions, health and wellness, the arts, social justice and human rights. Now I've written my brief unit overview a little bit differently than Lori and Bill. And that was one of our goals today to show you there's not one right way to do this. So I give a little bit of an overview of what this is about. And then you'll see I've broken it into three separate focuses, with my first focus being indigenous foods of Latin America second focus importance of indigenous foods and the third focus being the value of indigenous foods each with a little bit of a descriptor to um, prompt my thinking as i'm doing the planning and two inquiry questions what role does food play in people's lives and how does food impact people's lives my under the standards and functions, one of the things I did for myself was I went and I bolded the very specific language function that I was focusing on so that I could kind of pay attention to which one or ones I had selected. And then I bolded them right in my can do statements to keep them front and center in my mind. So I can infer the role of indigenous foods of Latin America in daily life and cultural practices over time by answering questions about a range of authentic resources, including, and I give a list. Again, this is at the unit level. I can ask and answer questions about indigenous foods of Latin America by interviewing classmates and members of the target culture. I can start thinking beyond what's happening in my classroom for my ultimate planning of lesson plans. I can exchange opinions about commercial practices over time related to the indigenous foods of Latin America by discussing historical reports and social media content with classmates. So again, I, I'm looking past and present. I can persuade others with evidence. And again, we're looking at checkpoint C, so that's so important. 
of the importance of free trade principles and practices by creating print and media resources for an awareness campaign. I can describe indigenous foods of Latin America and their importance to individuals, to cultures, and the world. That really goes along with the proficiency descriptor of advanced law, which is what we are aiming towards ultimately. Um, gathering and recording information from a range of um, sources. And I can compare the importance of food in my life with the importance of Latin America, uh, the importance in Latin America revealed through the authentic resources by reacting, by writing perhaps daily journal entries. So lots and lots of ideas that I can draw on in my daily lesson plans. So you can see that my summative performance tasks are actually falling more closely with that fair trade portion of the, the unit. You read the website posting, que es el comercio justo y por qué es importante, to identify arguments you can use to persuade others of the importance of fair trade. Then I've set this up IPA style. So one goes into the other, into the other. So now my interpersonal task is where you and a partner discuss what you learned about the importance of fair trade from the website and perhaps other resources you may have consulted. And then you exchange ideas about which arguments would be the best ones to include in a flyer. And the presentational task, well, create a flyer for your local fair trade store to distribute in which you offer multiple reasons why people should engage in fair trade practices, that real world connection. I'm not just doing it for the audience of my teacher and classmates, I'm doing it for a real world audience. My language toolbox, I've listed those key language functions. And then that were in my can do statements. And then what are the supporting language structures? Well, if I'm inferencing, and particularly with a focus on the past, the conditional for probability. At this point, they already know the conditional, but they'll still have partial control over being able to use it for purposes of probability. I want them to really build on those multiple clause questions, answers, responses. Remember, they're, move, they're in that intermediate, mid and high level. Um, and I want them to be able to have full control of those. Expressing reactions and persuading, present subjunctive, but they still are working at that conceptual control level. And then the comparative um, structures in order to be able to engage in cross-cultural comparisons, they'll have partial control. Some of the supporting vocabulary would be terms related to indigenous foods, cultivation practices, dishes and their ingredients, colonization terms, um, trade and fair trade terms, and of course, adjectives that would describe these various foods. And of course, my list of resources that correspond with the different tasks that I've identified. And some perhaps other materials, maybe some maps to help us look at um, what is happening relative to trade. Uh, Google Earth, following the, the, uh, the line of uh, transmission from one place to the next. And then a wonderful resource that Lori has recommended called Seeds of Change by the Smithsonian Institute, um, which might be just a great reference. So anyways, kind of bringing together this larger unit about Sabores de la América Latina. So I'm sure you're all asking, how do I get started on this? How I've got all these preparations, all these courses. Well, we've got some time. We've got time. We're only phasing in. We have two more, two academic years, two summers to before we even have to phase in the first level, we're only phasing in one level at a time. So this can be done. We have time to get this done. And how do we start? We'll start with where you are. And the way to do this for me is to audit what I'm already doing. 
you'll find in the folder a template for doing a unit audit, audit and it's in Word templates so that you can write in it. And I wanna take you through the different parts of it and then give you an example of how I audited a unit that I teach. So the first um, uh, section of the unit audit has you identify the language functions you're already using and you're already exercising. Then look at the instructional tasks you have your students do. Look at the assessments that you have them do. And then see if there are any gaps. Are you, are you missing any pieces for the standards? Are there some standards that you're hitting really well? Are there some standards that you're hitting uh, that you aren't hitting at all? Are there some fun language functions that you're using, but you could be more intentional about your use of them? Or are you kind of uh, scattershot all over the place on them? So it's a place for you to, to take a look at what you're doing and see how you're aligning with the five standards. So in my art unit, this is an art unit for Checkpoint C that I do. The original title is Artists of Spain, and it's designed for intermediate mid proficiency. I already, I knew it's standard one. I have a really strong base. I do a lot of understanding, interpreting of a lot of authentic documents throughout the whole thing. We have videos, infographics. I have tons of stuff and uh, that I use in instruction and in, in assessment. But as I looked at it, I saw, thought, well, maybe I can spend more time on analyzing the purpose for art as well as its genre. We mostly focus on the, the genre, the paintings, the styles and so forth, but maybe I could, take it up a notch if we looked at why do cre people create art, you know, from the people at uh, Altamira, the prehistoric folks, why did they create their art versus why did, say, someone, a court painter paint art versus why did Picasso do Guernica as a social protest? So deepen, it, deepen its um, significance by talking about the purpose, why people create art. Interpersonal, this was the weak sister for me of this. It was kind of a by the way <laughs> um, uh, standard in this particular unit. So as I went through, I thought, yeah, I did. We did conversations, but I really didn't have it thought through very well. So I could beef it up by including more opportunities for pair conversations. We did a lot of class conversations, but not a lot of pair conversations and help them focus up, um, on leveling up to strings of sentences in their responses, and also focus on those um, language uh, chunks that they need to express opinions and preferences, and maybe use a uh, chat mat as a scaffold to get that started. Standard three presentational, I had tons of stuff for presentational in describing and narrating were the two principal functions. We described works of art. We did this blabberized task where they made a piece of art come to life and talk. We did these stick, stick puppet role plays, tons of stuff for that. Uh, we did some assessment tasks, an essay. We did self portraits. So maybe to beef this section up, I might consider focusing on audience, maybe thinking of an audience wider than the class room to get the um, maybe other people in their um, community interested in art. The cultural perspectives, I pretty much had the works, the artists, the schools of art, um, and I assessed it through a lot of content questions on, on a unit test. Maybe we could explore the um, artwork studied, uh, the uh, who the audiences were, in other words, why they were producing the art, and how artists are which artists are represented in museums and which artists are not, which voices don't we hear? So I can expand that cultural perspective idea. And then cultural comparisons, I didn't do any of it. So just to add that in, in there will be something, there's a, there's a gap, I didn't do that. So now I can add that in and make this, beef this unit up. The second part of the template talks about, it just asks some questions, poses some questions. Does the unit use rich and up-to-date authentic resources? Do, do the images and resources show diverse cultural representation? Do assessments align with objectives driven by language functions? Does the unit theme engage students by integrating multiple topics? So I asked, answered those questions for my uh, unit. So I thought after reflecting on those questions, I thought, here's what I could do. I could purposefully develop the theme as art as a vehicle for social protest, expanding on the lessons I already do on Guernica and add maybe Botero's Abu Ghraib series and some other examples of social protest. I can expand 
the representation. Basically, my representation was mostly um, men from Spain, so I can maybe broaden it out to include um, the other uh, Spanish-speaking country, Rivera, Frida Kahlo, of course, Botero, Torres Garcia from Ecuador, including street art, and then look for some more women art artists, because I don't know of many, so that's an area where I need to grow my knowledge and maybe help my, my students and I can learn together. Develop an inquiry question related to the purpose of artistic production. Make that the focus of my unit. And then more intentionally consider integration of other topics, identity, family, social relationships, social justice, and human rights. So these are ways I can already build on what I'm already doing. I have tons of resources for, but that's just making sure it aligns. So I'm not starting from scratch. I don't have to reinvent the wheel here. I can, I can take what I use and then just align it better, make it richer experience. So at this point, what we can review our, um, our goals. We've identified the elements for the framework that informs the standards-based world language unit planning. I can identify the contents of the unit plan template and resources to support the development of the standards-based unit plan, analyze unit plans at three proficiency checkpoints, and then identify a set of strategies for auditing current unit plans. So we will unmute and I don't know, we're, uh, we're a little over time. I don't know if you wanna close and then we can hang around. How do you wanna do this, Candy? Sure. Uh, so we'll just close this up so we can stop our recording. So I wanna thank our presenters for a wonderful workshop today and all the staff who helped us with this. Remember, you'll get a certificate within about 24 hours of this workshop, and you'll also get a badge, which we ask you to consider uh, displaying either on your email or your website. The recording of this workshop will be made available early next week for those who weren't able to attend today. And just a reminder that the registration forms for the November through December workshops are now available, so please register.